today more than anything. Uh, Bill and Bill, I know, are going to uh, take a lot of questions. We're going to ask people to come up to a microphone if they have a question that they can answer. Mondo is going to moderate you know, the conversations and the questions. And uh, why don't you start us off with a word of prayer this yeah. morning. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, we know that you hold the world in your hand and we ask for your abundant grace uh, to be with everybody in the land of Israel today. We, again, we know that they are your chosen people and uh, you do not like war. We ask again that you would just be there, uh, that there, we pray for a spirit of calm, for sure. We ask as well, Lord, that uh, in the midst of all of it, that people would be drawn to you. That's, that's ultimately what you desire, is to see people to know you. And so we ask for those that are, that are traveling. We pray for peace, comfort for them. Ask again for wisdom, Lord, as we, as we traverse these things that we know Scripture has prophesied. Help us to have that, that confidence in you, uh, that it would increase our faith, and, and help us to, as well to be equipped to reach others for, um, really for the gospel. That's why we're here. So we ask for your blessing today. Clarity of mind and thought for all the speakers, uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Two quick things. We have rescheduled uh, Mr. DeYoung. He'll be speaking at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, which I think is in everyone's best interest. I know everyone wants to hear about events today. Uh, I also made an emergency run down to our ministry this morning to pick up copies of Bill's Future War Prophecies, how ironic. And his Psalm 83 book, you know, which we're all wondering, are we watching the beginning of something? So war started today. Maybe the rapture happens tomorrow. Uh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, buddy. You are looking sharp, man. <laughs> how close do you want to be? So, Bill and Bill are going to share just a few words, and then uh, the, mics, the mics are out here, and then if you, as always in a and a if you want to come, come up to the mic, and I, the other one's over here, and uh, so don't, don't be offended by this, but as Q&As are, we're not looking for sermons, we're not looking for your viewpoints, we're not looking for your theory of, of this or that before you get to your question, again, don't be offended by that, it just helps to keep the flow but if you have a thought or a question, go ahead and come up to the mic, and then we will uh, send it over to these guys. Okay. Let me start. Sure. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Um, well, many of you may know that overnight and into this morning, a massive attack, missile barrages of over several thousand missiles. Hamas is reporting 5,000 missiles shot into Israel. Uh, I don't think it's quite that many. It's somewhere between 2,200 and 5,000. They infiltrated through a barrier wall through, from the Gaza and started going door to door and taking hostages and killing Israelis. They said there's about 40 so far they found that were killed. There's dozens that have been taken hostage. How many wounded? 700 wounded? 700 are injured so far. Yeah. Wounded. That's the last number. So this is not a crosstown rivalry. This is not just a skirmish. This is the biggest thing that Israel's faced. Netanyahu has declared a war, of course, at this point. And so we're going to be watching very closely if this will escalate. Uh, you would have to think that this probably would not be done by Hamas on this size and scale without the approval of Iran. We're very concerned about talks with Saudi Arabia and Israel and Biden with normalization. They don't want that. So we have to see what, if this will escalate. And so we're going to, we'll answer the questions related to that and anything else you want to talk about in the Middle East. And Bill, of course, is a specialist on even American politics if you have questions about that as well. You want to say anything, Bill? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's been so much excitement about the uh, Israeli-Saudi talks, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, effort there at the uh, UN, his messages, also uh, Crown Prince Ben Salman, uh, optimistic tone at uh, the United Nations, and uh, also from Washington that uh, some kind of normalization uh, deal could be structured uh, that would be favorable, but obviously uh, Bill and I have talked about Iran. Uh, Iran's a major factor here, and uh, the whole purpose of normalization with Israel and the Arab countries is the purpose of uh, isolating Iran. Part of the U.S.-Israel-Saudi deal would be uh, U.S. guarantees of Saudi's uh, security. 
So uh, the recent, a uh, uh, couple of weeks ago, the Islamic Jihad, which is backed by Iran, fired a few missiles into Israel, and Israel took out a couple of their top leaders, and that got quiet pretty quick. But uh, also another concern uh, right now is the 15,000 missiles, uh, Iranian missiles that are in Lebanon and Syria, also deployment in Yemen and uh, Iraq, and the 150,000 rockets on the Israeli border uh, in the hands of Hezbollah. So this is what Bill and I watched very closely. So uh, a lot of optimism the last couple of weeks that uh, something might work out between uh, uh, Israel when you have the prime minister and also the most powerful person in Saudi Arabia talking about a, a warm relationship uh, that, that looks like uh, that stirred up uh, the Palestinians even. We've become a second a second story here, not the first story. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this takes place. But as some of the uh, broadcasters are saying today, this is the first surprise attack of any significance. It's a lot less than Yom Kippur, but Yom Kippur was a surprise attack. This is as well. And uh, Bill and I talked also about how this has galvanized the, the support in Israel between the right and left, which is pretty unusual. But I mean, as Netanyahu declared today, this is, we're in a war. Can you guys uh, give, maybe give some background to the the various players ge geographically, you know, whether, you know, in the south and in the north and then in the northeast. Who, who's where, for those that might not know that? Which groups? And where? And, it, you know, the, their enemies surrounding them. Kind of give some background of where they're located and which groups, you know, the Hamas is in the south, et cetera. Lebanon, sure. Syria. Yeah, so, you want me to take that? Yeah, go Sorry. ahead. Then I'll add okay. to that, Bill. Well, of course, Andrew, Israel is surrounded by enemies that have harbored an ancient hatred from time immemorial around them. From to the north in Lebanon, you have the Hezbollah. Bill said there's 150,000 missiles there. They have some precision guided missiles there. Who I was in my talk yesterday, one of the headlines I read is the, the concern that Hezbollah could lob the first few days 6,000 missiles a day into Israel. There would be days long, days long blackouts, hun hundreds dead, thousands wounded. That was the, the concerns they have just for the first few days from Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah is a proxy of Iran, and also proxies of Iran would include Syria, who's used chemical weapons and has chemical weapons. They used them 300 times in the revolution that they had just finished with. Of course, Hamas, they had said back in 2019, we could send 1,000 missiles a day into Israel. They sent well over that now. This is a few years later. They can obviously send several thousand missiles into Israel in any given day. Bill mentioned the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that is another proxy of Iran. They're inside the West Bank primarily. Iraq also has proxies, Shia militias inside of, excuse me, Iran, Shia militias inside of Iraq. Yeah, they also have proxies with the Yemen way down, the Houthis down in Yemen. They also have precision guided missiles. They say they could hit Tel Aviv with those. In fact, these rockets today did go to Tel Aviv. They went to the Dimona nuclear reactor area. They went to, I, I think, even Jerusalem. So, uh, and then also you have the countries that I believe were in Psalm 83, in addition to those that were, uh, went to war with Israel in 1948, that would include Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, etc. So those are all, and the Palestinians, of course. So they're all surrounding Israel. They're involved, I believe, in the Confederacy in Psalm 83. Uh, speaks about they want to destroy the nation of Israel, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. I'll be talking about that again tonight. I talked about it last night as well. So those are the players around there. Not, they're not including the Ezekiel 38 countries that you might be familiar with that prophecy, like Russia. Uh, of course, Iran is in Ezekiel 38, but Iran is also another prophecy in Islam. I talked about that last night. So they got two prophecies. But it's not including Turkey. It's not including the North African countries of Libya and Ethiopia and Sudan and Morocco, some of those other Ezekiel 38 countries. Those are different. They probably would not be involved in this particular fray that's going on, whereas the other countries surrounding Israel from the inner circle around Israel, uh, they could be drawn into this. We don't know. We're watching it very closely. Talk about the politics uh, and the uniqueness of the current Israeli Knesset and how it contributes to even the, the perception that Hamas and other the, the enemies have about Israel and its, you know, its religious content and you know, makeup. Bill? Well, Mondo, it's always... Uh, uh, I, I, a contact sport in Israel. Can't imagine being a prime minister over such a dysfunctional country that we love so much. 
it's almost impossible uh, to, to piece it all together. You know, I mentioned that it looks like there will be, and Bill and I talked about this, about a unity government uh, over this act of war. So uh, that's, there's been so much tension in Israel the last five, six months over ju much needed judicial reform that that's created great division, even greater division between the left and right in Israel. Um, from a political standpoint, I'll throw this in. You're talking about some of the terror groups around, uh, uh, around Israel and the Middle East. I think what's been happening on the, on the diplomatic and political front is the fact that Erdogan's been open to having uh, discussions with uh, Herzog, the president of, uh, of Israel, and also recently uh, Netanyahu. Uh, if you look at some of the sound bites of uh, Erdogan over the years, they, they've been scathing comments uh, about Israel. Over, I mean, scathing. Uh, what is uh, uh, ironic, um, as far as when, Net, uh, when uh, Obama was in uh, Israel a few years ago, uh, he was meeting with er uh, Netanyahu and he forced Erdogan, or forced Netanyahu to call Erdogan to kind of make amends and try to get things moving in the right direction. Didn't do much. What's interesting is right after that conversation between Netanyahu and Erdogan that uh, Obama brokered, a massive uh, sandstorm came in from Egypt, and it was so significant that he couldn't fly a helicopter from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and then from Bethlehem to Ben-Gurion Airport to leave. And the farewell tents at the Ben-Gurion Airport were taken down by this massive <laughs> sandstorm. So he could, uh, Obama visit to... Israel and massive, if you put it into Google, massive storm. I mean, literally, so the farewell was done in a small room at Ben Gurion Airport instead of all these fancy tents. So, um, you know, I think uh, the Abraham Accord on the surface sounds great. My problem with the Abraham Accord, it creates this illusion that the land of uh, the, uh, the Abraham's descendants all have a right to the land. Isn't that interesting? On September 15, 2020, when they were signing the Abraham Accord at the White House, a massive hurricane called Sally was about ready to hit the southern Gulf Coast. One of our readers who I'd met uh, here uh, at, at in, oh, actually in Colorado Springs at one of the Prophecy Watchers conference said, Bill, do you realize Sally, the Hebrew derivative of Sally is Sarah. So we had Hurricane Sarah ready to slam into the southern Gulf Coast as the Abraham Accords is being signed at the White House and it came ashore the next day. So it's, you know, Abraham Accords, normalization, business deals, Jared Kushner's making a, a lot of money right now. He has a $3 billion sovereign fund. His biggest partner is the Saudis. They have a billion in the fund, and they're starting to buy companies in Israel with this money. Uh, also, one of the Israeli companies sold a billion, billion dollars of their assets in the Chevron Noble Energy uh, oil off, off Israel's coast. Uh, so you got to, uh, to the United Arab Emirates. So when I look at, when I interviewed Ambassador Friedman last year in Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, I said, you know, Ambassador Friedman, you know, really the Abraham Accords is, is a business deal. It's about business deal. It's about making peace. And I, I'm throwing this out because the dynamics of the Abraham Accords, even in my book, Eye to Eye, when the suicide bombings in Israel were at the highest level of intensity was when Ariel Sharon was actively involved in negotiating a two-state plan with George Bush and Abbas. So when I look at an event like this, a secret attempt, here the excitement of Israel making peace at the expense of 134 Jewish communities that should have sovereignty. The Abraham Accords also stopped the sovereignty of those 130, the rightful extension of sovereignty to those Jewish communities. So there's a lot of excitement about the Abraham Accords. So I go, whoa, what is this, Lord? And he reminded me this morning, the major suicide bombings in Israel all, were take, all took place at the very time Israel was talking to Palestinians through Ariel Sharon about a two-state plan. So that's just another dynamic I'm throwing into it uh, 
uh, positives, but at the same time, the false narrative that the land of Israel is to all Arab, uh, all Abraham's descendants is, is once again being played out on the public stage. Hey, Manu, can I, uh, I want to direct your attention to three prophecies that could be involving the Hamas and might find application. There's actually four. Uh, so you might want to note these, and I'll be talking about some of these tonight as well. If you go to Isaiah 11, it talks around uh, the uh, verses 14. Building up to it, it talks about Israel being regathered together, no longer a divided kingdom. Ephraim and Judah will be one. And it goes on to say they will, verse 4, but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philippines toward the west. They shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom, which is southern Jordan, Moab, well, central Jordan. People of Ammon shall obey them, northern Jordan. The point is, the Gaza Strip is where ancient Philistia. So the Philistines are involved in this prophecy, that, and it looks like Israel's the IDF is going to and they're regathered in the nations, become a united nation, and fly down upon them. We go to the next one we would go to would be Zephaniah 2. Get there in a moment. And it talks about verse 4 on For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate, they shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast referring to the Felicia area of the Gaza. Nation of the Cherethites were also dwelt there. The Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you. There shall be no inhabitant. The seacoast and the pastures will shelter for shepherds and folds of flock. The coast will be for the remnant of Judah. That's Judah's territory over there. And then the other one that I would look at real quickly is Ezekiel 25. And we get down, it prefaces by talking about verses 13 and 14. It says, the Lord God, I am against Edom. That would, I believe that's talking about tents of Edom in Psalm 83, the Palestinian refugees. And uh, also Edom was a territory in southern Jordan. But Edom, Edomites have descendants, ethical representation of the Palestinians. I will cut off man and beast from it and make it desolate from Taman, which is in southern Jordan. Dedan, which is Saudi Arabia, shall fall by the sword. That's a prophecy that's not fulfilled, by the way. So if there's any normalization coming out of Saudi Arabia, there's actually four prophecies involving them. Three of them have no normalization at all in them. This is one of them. Saudi Arabia shall fall by the sword. I'll execute my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, Israeli defense forces. And they will do according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord. And So we're talking about the Israeli defense forces attacking the Edomites, and of course that would be, I believe, the Palestinian Saudi Arabia is involved in this as well. But then it goes on to say, in that context, dealing with Felicia, verse 15, thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines dealt vengefully and took vengeance with a spiteful heart to destroy because of the old hatred. They hate the Jews. It's an ancient hatred. Because they have vengeance, they try to destroy them because of the ancient hatred. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand Remember, he just stretched out his hand with the people of Israel for Edom. I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Cherethites from, and destroy the remnant from the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I have laid my vengeance upon them. So I think those are unfulfilled prophecies. I think they're relevant to the Gaza area, the Hamas, if they find application in our time. And I don't think we have a lot of time left, so I think this is in our time. So basically, I would direct your attention to Zephaniah 2. Ezekiel 25, and Isaiah 11, anything related to the Gaza or Philistia, the Philistines, the Cherethites. Because remember when these prophets wrote, they did not have you know, Hamas and Hezbollah and things like that. They had Edomites and Megabites and Ammonites and Termites. And <laughs> <laughs> also, another thing that I'm wondering about, Bill, you know, this judicial reform that's going on, of course, the reservists for, a lot of the reservists were not going to report for duty, and all of a sudden, then, you know, it was calling on these reservists now to go to battle. Well, I, I happened to catch a Bloomberg article this morning, and they were, had a long list of, uh, being a Jewish news organization, they were talking about a long list of things, and this is really an opportune time for Hamas to do what they're doing. And the question now is, will Hezbollah be pulled in, or Islamic Jihad 
so yeah, absolutely, Bill. I think with the judicial reform, it's been very divisive. I mean, you have Israeli soldiers who are on 60 minutes that refuse to serve. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of tension. Uh, and, and, and again, this is a, an opportune time for Hamas to do what they did. Uh, putting it in perspective, over 3,000 rockets were fired in 10 to 11 hours, where the last uh, event that they had with Hamas uh, it was 10 days, and it was just over 3,000 rockets. So that's substantially more. And it definitely has to do with uh, the uh, morale of the military right now over the judicial reform. Yeah, and it's interesting because of recently there was a security meeting with Netanyahu and some of his close-ups, and they did not invite Ben Gavir and uh, Smotrich, the right-wingers in his coalition, because they, and that's odd that they should do that because, of course, they would step away from the coalition at some point if they did. There'd have to be another election, and polls had been showing that Gantz would actually could possibly win over Netanyahu. But he didn't invite them because they were making comments like, well, they want to come along and talk about killing people and things like that. So there's the, the concerns about the normalization with Saudi Arabia and Israel put together, Biden's trying to put that together. The right wing coalition was a concern of that, those, especially those couple of guys because they would stand in the way of that, because one of the calls for the Saudi normalization deal was they would have to put, do concessions for a Palestinian state, and they would draw their attention to the Arab Peace Initiative, which was put together in 2002 by the Saudis, approved by the 22 members of the Arab League, accepted by 58 Muslim countries, to, that Israel would simply have to give up the land they had acquired in 1967, just give up land for peace, made East Jerusalem the capital of Israel, and uh, uh, there's one other thing that will come to mind in just a moment, but that was, that's all they wanted, give us the land that you took for peace. Uh, capital, oh, and a right of return of the refugees, that was the other one. In other words, those refugees who were displaced in 1948, now they're the Palestinian refugees, they're in the Gaza, or the Hamas, or they're in the West Bank, they're in Lebanon, they're in Jordan. In fact, 60% of Jordan is Palestinian. Uh, they want to come back, that's called the right of return of the refugees. It's a no-go for Israel, but that's part of the Arab Peace Initiative, in addition, Saudi Arabia wanted to have a nuclear defense program established by America. They wanted to have a civil uh, security pact with America to protect them from Iran. So it was all about Saudi Arabia wanting these things. But this Arab Peace Initiative, while Rain came out and said this is the bedrock of, a, of this Abraham of the uh, normalization, the, while Rain is part of the Abraham Accords, so is uh, the UAE, and they're all calling for a Palestinian state. The UAE as well. That was not brought up to the attention of everybody initially when Donald Trump was putting this together, the Aram Accords. So it always goes back to the fact that Palestinians need to have a Palestinian state. So uh, I, the concerns is, we were watching this closely the last few days, but Saudi Arabia may, because of their own personal interests, put off the Palestinian cause, throw money at it, say, we'll get back to you because they had other interests involved in normalizing with Israel. But now this thing that's going on right now, Bill, it could pretty much just show, throw the <laughs> normalization talks yeah, way back on the back pages for a while. Yeah, the Palestinians, um, I think what's happened over the years, the Palestinian narrative that in order to have peace in the Middle East, which has been promoted by King Abdullah of, of Jordan, if we want peace in the Middle East, we need to have a deal between Israel and the Palestinians. And I... Uh, uh, was at a, an event in Washington a few years ago. Uh, General Jones, who was Obama's uh, national security advisor, came up and said, that's why we need to make peace. And I said, General Jones, let me go through country after country in the Middle East of Arab fighting Arab and Hamas fighting Fatah. And how do you say that Israel and the Palestinians are a key to Middle East peace when the Arabs can't even get along with each other? And that's how absurd it is. And I think Crown, it was, uh, the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative was promoted by Crown Prince Abdullah, and, um, and it just kind of went, went to the wayside. But when Israel agreed to the Abraham Accords, all of a sudden you're hearing about the UN resolutions, 242, 338. You're hearing about the Arab Peace uh, Treaty that Bill just mentioned. All of a sudden, these things resurface again. Uh, as part of the reason that they made peace with Israel. Every Middle East leader, including the ones involved right after the Abraham Accords was signed in September of 2020, 
went to the UN and said the main reason they favored it is to stop the annexation of Jewish communities. And that was the bottom line. But, so what's happened right now, Prince, uh, Crown Prince Salman pretty much said, we're going to cut our deal with, uh, with Israel. The Palestinian situation is important, which his father continues to speak of. But that's not a priority. And like Bill said, they'll probably work out money and stuff like that and things like that to kind of attempt to appease the Palestinians. Although Habat, I mean, Abbas, the president of, of, uh, of the Palestinians, he's on his uh, 17th year of a four-year term. What a government. And... Hamas. So all of a sudden, when they don't get their attention and when the world's not focused on Hamas or Islamic Jihad or the Fatah and Abbas, they do something stupid like this. But anyhow, this is the final days. Alignments are continuing. Uh, it, it might derail some of the conversation, but I, I was somewhat amazed at the level of high-profile cooperation between Netanyahu and Ben Salman at the UN, I thought, they're going to do something. Not sure what it's going to do, but they're going to get something. If it's not this year, maybe next year. And the question is, will that be a precursor of the Daniel 927 or the final covenant? Or will it become the final covenant? I don't know. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting in a, in a sense. And I know, Bill, you have different perspectives sometimes on 927. But some kind of agreement is going to be signed leading up to the uh, conclusion well, I, before the Lord's return. I don't think the Daniel 927 covenant has anything to do with Arab-Israeli peace. <clears throat> There's no biblical support for that. I think the Arab-Israeli peace comes militarily, not politically brokered. Uh, I believe the Israeli defense forces will take out all their enemies around them, and then they can... I think the peace covenant has something to do with Israel's desire to build a temple. I think, And I have three clues that I put forward in my books of why the true content of the false covenant is dealing with Israel's ability, in part, to build a, a third temple. But you know, Hamas in general, in the past, what they would do, they'd be like the boxer that would lead first with their chin, right? They'd start throwing <laughs> missiles forward and that sort of thing. They would hope that they would bring forward the unite the Arab world to galvanize them to come against Israel. But it never really worked. They acted out of concert, but by themselves. But to think of the level that's going on right now, you might have to think that Iran has told them to go ahead and do this because Iran is very concerned about this normalization agreement potential between Israel and Saudi Arabia because Iran has made an octopus stranglehold over the Middle East. They've got control over Lebanon, with Hezbollah, they've got control over Syria, they're trying to get control over Yemen, they've got growing control over Iraq, uh, into the West Bank now with the Palestinian Jihad, the Gaza, etc. So they don't want a normalization agreement. So as a matter of fact, earlier this year, I think it was around April, they went to China, and China brokered a, a relationship, a restored relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran because Saudi Arabia was hedging its bets. If we, we don't want to, to attack Iran and we don't trust the Biden administration, but we need protection from their nuclear program. The, the, you know, the Saudis are Sunni, the Iranians are Shiite, there's a schism in Islam between them. So they started hedging their bets and starting to make a relationship with Iran themselves, as did the UAE, who's a member of the Abraham Accords. So uh, that was all happening just a few months back. Now all of a sudden there's a shift in things. And so to me, it's kind of like when they bring up the Arab Peace Initiative, it's kind of like you, know, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Now there's still a problem. Nothing's going to change. Israel's not going to give up land. They're not going to let the refugees come back into the land. And what, the, what the Israel was supposed to get out of the Arab Peace Initiative is that the Arabs would say, okay, we have said the Arab-Israeli conflict is ended. We will guarantee the security of the states in that neighborhood, and we will all live in neighborliness. But it's like, give up the land, let the Palestinians come back, and then you can have those things, as if they could ensure that. And like Bill said, they've been fighting each other no matter what. They can't ensure anything. The Arabs fight the Arabs more than the Arabs fight the Jews. So that whole thing is going to go by the wayside. But now there's a new thing. You've heard of IHOP, International House of Pancakes? Well, there's a uh, HCOP, which is Hashemite Kingdom of Pancakes. I mean, Hashemite Kingdom of Palestine is what it's called. So that was my one joke of the morning. Uh, I, I need more coffee, and I'll, get, I'll really get on a roll. And that's a thing you might start hearing surfacing. This came out in June of 2022 by a Saudi diplomat. He put it together. It's actually a pretty ingenious plan. 
that won't work for Israel. But what they want to do is they're, they're saying that they need to redefine the Palestinian refugee problem because the Nakba, the disaster of 1948, they call it Nakba, they celebrate it when the Palestinians got the, the war and Israel won the war and you had the Palestinian refugees. Well, they always wanted to go back into their homes and stuff like that, but 75 years later, you know, there's still, the, the, Israel's moved into those territories. That's not, they're not going to go back into those lands, so they're trying to redefine it and give them a citizenship into the Jordan area. They'll make a contingu contiguous state between the Gaza, the West Bank, the Jordan Valley and Jordan. The capital of Palestine would be inside of Jerusalem, uh, not Jerusalem, uh, Amman, Jordan. And that, there's a few more things that they want to implement in that. And it's actually a pretty impressive plan, if, if the way it's been presented. But it won't work for Israel, of course. They can't allow those areas to be connected from the Gaza to the West Bank to the, and through the Jordan Valley and that sort of thing. So, but you might start hearing more about the Hashemite Kingdom of Pancakes plan. <laughs> Palestine. We, uh, we got your map up, Bill, on the screen. People were asking for a map of your Psalm 83. And so, again, you want to maybe, there's a lot of red here <laughs> around the little nation of Israel. Talk, talk a little bit about the players. Yeah, and these are all the players. So you see this map shows the ancient names written by Asaph 3,000 years ago in Psalm 83, verses 6 through 8, superimposed upon a modern-day map of Israel. This is their modern-day equivalent. They form an inner circle of countries around Israel. All these countries did go to war against Israel in 1948. So we see that this is a prophecy in process. It didn't fulfill the prophecy because... Psalm 83, it's got 18 verses, only the first eight could have potentially been fulfilled here. But we see when Israel became a nation in the land back in 1948, these countries did not want that. They voted against Israel at the United Nations in 1947. When Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948, they had told the Arabs that were living in what was once called Palestine to vacate because they would go to war against Israel. They had them outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned, outweaponed. And Israel won that war with a few fighter jets some hand grenades, and some glass milk containers. Now, how did they do that against those massive Arab armies? Because God is for Israel. God has plans for Israel. So at that point, Jerusalem became a divided city. They did a, a, part, a partition there. And that didn't last, because that's not biblically endorsed. Jerusalem was never to be divided. And then less than 20 years later, 1967, Israel took over in a six-day war all of Jerusalem. Of course, they made the colossal mistake of allowing the Temple Mount to be under Jordanian control through the Waq Antiquity Society. And that's where the Dome of the Rock is, and that's where you got the, the problem <coughs> around the temp Temple Mount. But these countries want to come together, and they want to wipe Israel off the map. And I'll be showing you tonight with slides and things like that how Israel's defense forces are going to take each one of them out one by one, the Saudis, the Hamas, the Palestinians, the Jordanians, etc. Because they're going to try to make a final attempt to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem in Zechariah 12.2. And the Lord is going to divinely intervene in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces. And I'll be showing you what the Lord's going to do. And so you guys will be impressed because you could actually might see this in the church age. Well, you know, when you look at that, Bill, uh, you know, uh, Bill Psalm 83, it was one of, it's been out for quite a few years. And I think that what it's interesting, uh, if in fact we're that close, uh, uh, you know, these relationships, I mean, Bill has his perspective on this. Israel's relationship with some of these countries is the best it's ever been. And what these countries have decided is it's better to, to be at peace with Israel because we don't trust the Iranians. We don't trust the Iranians. And the Iranians are very smart. The Persian people are extremely intelligent, just like the uh, Jewish people. Um, so the, the bottom line here, uh, if all of this is going to take place, it's going to take a while. I don't, I, you know, Bill, I might differ on that, but... I, these relationships are the, probably the only good thing about the Iran nuclear deal with Obama, when Obama was in office. It said to the Arab countries, we need, an, uh, we need an ally in the Middle East. We don't trust Obama, and the enemies uh, do not fear him. So the thing is, we need to have a relationship with Israel because we might have to rely on Israel to go against Iran, not, not the United States, because they won't be there. So, you know, we have our own opinion on this. I, I just think the relationships between Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, and uh, even oh, Morocco has always been good, 
uh, is very good with Israel right now. So, and I have friends in the Israeli government that are saying, who would ever think that we would have Arab allies in the Middle East? We get along with them better today than we ever have. And the only relationship they had previously was a, a defense relationship. Now it's a combination of defense and business. So the dynamics is taking place right now is let's pull, let's pull all the anti-Iran groups together with the United States and Israel in the event, and, and at the same time, Iran has a plan. Israel has a plan too. Israel has a red line. They almost hit that in the summer of 2016 when Russia and Syria and Iran were moving troops toward Israel's northern border. Two of our ambassadors, Jeffers and Crocker, says, we're real close to Israel crossing the red line and doing something very serious. And I think that's one of the questions right now in Israel. When is Israel very likely themselves going to deal with the Iran threat. And that is getting closer by the day. What we saw with Hamas, if Hezbollah gets involved with this and starts firing rick, uh, rockets and missiles at Israel, this thing could get out of control really fast. And that's kind of where we're standing right now. Well, and so Bill, you and I both agree that the Jeremiah 49 verses 34 through 39, the Elam prophecy deals with Iran. Yep. And that's what we're thinking could be coming pretty soon, Israel dealing with yeah, that. Yeah, Jeremiah area. 49, 35 through 39, Elam, which Elam is the prophecy. That's the, that's a section of Iran today, modern day Iran, that hugs the Persian Gulf. I was talking about this last night, where the missile silos are, the, under, the portable rocket launchers, they're underground air base, they get some nuclear reactor there, Bushar. Uh, if Israel takes that out, I believe Iran would call on its proxies, and you'd see Hezbollah lobbing missiles, Syria would be getting involved. Israel would take out Damascus. We find out in Isaiah 17, verse 1, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Isaiah 17, 9 says, The desolation is caused by the children of Israel. And Isaiah 17, 14 says, One night you see Damascus, in the morning it's gone. So Israel has the ability to take out a major city. Now, recently Syria rejoined the Arab League after being taken away about a decade after their Syrian revolution. So they're back in the Arab League. Now, if Israel takes out the Arab city of Damascus, I believe the other Arab cities would be very concerned, like Beirut, Amman, Jordan, Cairo, Mecca, etc. Amman should be concerned, and I'll be showing the verses on this tonight, because Amman, Jordan, in Jeremiah 49, verse 2, it says there'll be an alarm of war in Amman, which is the capital of Jordan, of Rabbah, the Ammonites. It'll be a desolate mound, and Israel will take possession of its inheritance, and that has not happened yet. This peace treaty with Jordan will go away. Every time Israel tries to do something on the Temple Mount, the Jordanian parliament basically says we should shred our peace agreement. So the peace agreement is not in that prophecy. It's also not in Zephaniah 2, verses 8 through 9, which says, I've heard the reproach of Ammon and Moab, that would be northern Jordan and central Jordan, against Israel's borders. Uh, the residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. It's another camera angle, Jeremiah 49, verse 2. So we got war coming with Israel and Jordan. Two prophecies not found fulfillment. They weren't part of 1948. Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel. Isaiah 19, I think he makes it pretty clear that that peace treaty is going to be gone too. Israel will become a terror. Isaiah 19, verses 16 through 18. Israel will become a terror. Judah will become a terror to the land of Egypt. And five cities will ultimately speak their language of Hebrew. It says, or Canaan, which is Hebrew. Isaiah 19, 18. So uh, I get into these in my future war prophecies book that, that we got. Somebody three book as well. So um, I agree with you, Bill. Right now there is these, these peace treaties that would make it look like the, the, the Somali treaty probably couldn't happen at this point in time. But things shift real quickly. Like overnight you wake up and now there's you know, 3,000 missiles lobbed into Israel from Hamas. That's how quick things can change over there. Yeah, it'll be interesting because, you know, as you know, Bill, the Saddam Hussein's down, Gaddafi's down. Uh, there's no really strong leader. Erdogan is attempting to cooperate with Israel. So some of the most cantankerous problematic leaders in the Middle East are history. They're gone. Uh, 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 even Soleimani, when the uh, Trump administration took Soleimani out, uh, the Iranian, uh, one of the top most influential people in Iran. So you got Soleimani out, Baghdadi out, Saddam Hussein out, Gaddafi out, and Erdogan cooperating. So the dynamics have changed a lot in the last couple of years. So it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. My number one concern is Iran. They're very smart, they're very strategic, they've got a plan, and they're patient. And they, they've been hammered right and left over and over, and they haven't done anything yet. And they're very close to a nuclear weapon. And the saying over the years is, 
you know, everybody thinks Israel's the first target of a, of a nuclear Iran, but the people in the Middle East that, that, that are in the know say, no, it's Saudi Arabia, because that relationship between the Sunnis and the Shiite is so bad. And Iran wants to be, the Shia Islam, to be the predominant uh, sect in Islam. So uh, the, the dynamics right now at play are so interesting. Uh, Israel talking to the Saudis, uh, Abraham Accords, whether we like him or not, uh, just all the dynamics. And then the division in Israel between the, over judicial reform and the tension between secular Israel and the Orthodox Jews that have a lock grip on a lot of things in Israel. It's just, uh, and I've talked to friends in Israel, said I, we have not seen the lev this level of intent tension in their lifetime between different groups within Israel. So this war could uh, conceptually calvin uh, galvanize Israel's support, a united front. And I think that that's kind of what we talked about early, uh, early in our message today, is that that could come from this. But anything, I mean, Iran, I mean, if, if, I think the key here is if Iran tells the Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah, now things could change dramatically quick. That would be the game changer. Yeah. Right now, Israel better hope it just gets confined into the Gaza-Israel battle. But again, this is not the normal Israel crosstown you know, rivalry with Hamas. This is major. Yeah, and the other concern um, is the, the animosity in the Palestinian communities. Usually when there was a conflict between Israel and Hamas or Fatah, it was isolated into the big communities, Ramallah, Gaza. But what has happened, the Palestinians have used TikTok, and some of the adversaries of Israel have used TikTok to incite uh, riots within uh, Israeli communities. And my friends in Israel have always been concerned about civil war between Israel, not, it wouldn't be a civil war, but a, a war between Israel and the Palestinians in communities throughout Israel. That's the other thing we're watching pretty carefully. Uh, Iran, number one. But these, the tension in the Israeli communities, even they're talking about it at the United Nations, must quell or must, must calm. But TikTok, Chinese influence TikTok has been one of the greatest instigators of tension between Israelis and Palestinians throughout the communities in the last year, year and a half. Okay, we got, uh, we got just a few minutes left. Want to ask a question over there? Promoting this. Um, what's what's Russia's role in arming Hamas? Is that true? Is, that true? is there any? In, is well, there you any... hear that on and off. I haven't heard much about it lately, but maybe that's that's possible. But in the past, uh, Abbas spent a lot of time in uh, Moscow meeting with Putin. Uh, there was a tight relationship uh, previously. Uh, I haven't heard much about that recently, and you know, and also Erdogan and Qatar were putting a lot of money behind Hamas and Islamic Jihad over the last five, ten years as well, uh, with Erdogan attempting to reach, uh, reach out to Israel and vice versa, Israel reaching out to Erdogan. Uh, I haven't heard that as much, but it, in the, a couple of the last conflicts that Israel had with Hamas, a lot of the blame was going towards Erdogan and Turkey for his instigation uh, of that conflict. Okay. Uh, Islamic Jihad is being armed by Iran, and I would imagine Hamas as well. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, that, that was a good segue into my question. Uh, the, the last um, uh, conflict that Israel had with Hamas, uh, right at the end, uh, they were politically required to pull out after they had done some damage with tunnels and stuff like that. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, not prime minister at that time, I believe, uh, went to the, uh, uh, the Gaza uh, border and with the troops there, with their national microphones and television and everything, he made the comment after being asked, what are they going to do now? He said, well, we've decided that we're not going to play this game anymore. We're going to go back to the way they did it in the old days. And he said that was, if we are invaded, we're going to stop the invasion. We're going to invade them, and we're going to wipe them out. Well, this is that time. So what I'm wondering is, uh, is he going to back off on that? Because I think he ran 
uh, his, pre his prime minister uh, 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 position uh, that he got back. He was just reelected. This is so different. This is so different. <clears throat> They're using all kinds. They infiltrated some of the Israeli communities. They're using hang gliders, paraglider. I mean, they're using drones. I mean, this is a, this is a, a Hamas uh, instigated war. This is beyond anything we've seen just with rockets being fired. When you have 3,000 rockets being fired in 10 to 11 hours, that's substantial. Right. We've never had a rocket barrage like this. This is much more premeditated than any other conflict with, that Israel has had with Hamas. And this could be the catalyst Netanyahu is politically savvy, but it also could be the catalyst to create some kind of unity at a time that unity is essential. And I think a lot of Israeli citizens are going to say, okay, enough is enough. Let, it, let them have it. All right, we got, uh, and unfortunately, the, the Palestinian people, <clears throat> once again, most of them want to live in Israel or an Israeli-controlled uh, country, are going to be the, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the ones that pay the greatest price once again. Yeah. We got with all those got politics that are coming into play here too. With yeah. Saudi Arabia. I, I, I just think what's interesting <laughs> is the EU and the I didn't catch that, but uh, what's, what's interesting right now, the EU and the United States were the first ones to harshly condemn what Hamas did because in the past they weren't so quick. But after they saw a level of cooperation between Israel and the Saudis at the UN, that uh, created a different dynamic politically uh, uh, for Israel. All right, Thank we, we got to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to have you... Go ahead. Quick go ahead. question. Um, so, based on the charged affair, U.S. charged affair in Jerusalem has come out and said that they would support Israel, but the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs has come out and said that they hold Israel responsible, which looks almost like a condemnation. So my question is, what is the path forward at this point? Do you, what are your opinions on the path forward with Saudi seemingly siding with the Palestinians in this? You got uh, one minute. Are you or saying less? that a, recent, <laughs> a report right now just came out that Saudi Arabia is holding Israel responsible it says, for the Hamas official attack? statement from the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs: The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia holds Israel responsible for what has transpired due to its repeated provocations and deprivation of the rights of the Palestinians. Oh. For today's event, today's this event. Is, this is today. This is coming out yeah, from Mario Yeah, there Nepal. you go. That doesn't help talks. The normalization is going to be way back on the back pages for a little while, in my yeah. estimation. That, that will not help talks. And Israel's going to, <laughs> Israel's going to if, if, they, if Israel can, they're going to blow the Gaza to smithereens. And if they start to do that, I think that may draw in a larger conflict from the north. And one, one other quick note here. It was interesting in 2005, Netanyahu prophesied, well, I could say prophesied, Netanyahu said he did not favor Israel leaving Gaza because when we leave Gaza, there's going to be rockets raining down on our cities. Benjamin Netanyahu, the summer of 2005, before 9,500 Jews were ripped from their homes, and their businesses. He called it, call it Hamastan. Yeah. Uh, Hamastan, yeah. yeah. All right, guys, let's give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to take, take a short break, and then uh, we'll get started with the regular schedule.